It's great to be here again, and uh, there's various things I like to imagine I'm an honorary of since being a writer is just being an amateur, everything, and geography is way up towards the top of the list. I should say that the, atlas, the third atlas, uh, the one I'm co-authoring with Josh out in October, is called Nonstop Now, Titles Move Around. And um, so, and um, maybe we should start with the slide. So with Atlas is our enormous collaborations. We probably should have had a slide of the title page. And um, each map can involve a dozen people. Uh, the first two atlases have 22 maps apiece. The last one has 26. Um, Monarchs and Queens, for example, is my idea. Uh, there's a lot of pairings, as you'll see in atlases, about public, queer public spaces and social spaces and butterfly habitat, which is partly about efficient use of your geography. Butterflies tend to like the unpaved stuff, and all the rest of this is in the paved world. But also about pairing things like that is really looking at San Francisco as what it was until it became too expensive, a kind of refuge habitat in which things like the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence flourish that flourish nowhere else as well as endemic species uh, in the kind of unique weather, uh, soil, habitat of uh, the, this sort of foggy peninsula in this Mediterranean climate on the edge of the continent. So, um, so a map like this, uh, you know, there was research that involved going to gay and lesbian archives, talking to lepidopterists, uh, and uh, sending data to a cartographer who gave us a nice rough, ugly looking map having it made beautiful by Leah Chandra, the art director for all these, and then sending it, in this case, to Mona Caron for the art on top, and the poet, uh, Aaron Shuren, did an amazing essay. So, you know, when I set out to make atlases with a desire to revisit what maps have been and what they could be, what they have been is in the ways that they're imagined to be rich, in which they help us understand where we are, and uh, not, not to go back to military and imperial and colonial uses of maps, but to try and do a more radical cartography from, uh, you know, from the bottom up in some ways, or a populist cartography, and to really kind of shake up and get over the world of listening to your cell phone give you orders as a form of navigation. And one thing I've found, the example, poor, poor Josh, um, has heard me say this so many times. Uh, to, um, but I came, started to spend a lot of time in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. I had a Garmin device and a $5 gas station map. And I could use a Garmin device for a thousand years and I'd still just be, you know, a kind of servant of the machine obediently following orders. But, uh, you know, a few weeks with the gas station map and, you know, I became the map. I became the Atlas of New Orleans. I started to know where I was and where the major arteries were, and how the streets that go north go south when the river bends again, and uh, some of the patterns. And, you know, there's, uh, so there's something about, we, I wanted to look at, we think cities, we think paper maps, etc. My fab, fantastic collaborator, Josh, who was still a grad student, I think, when we were doing the first book, came along and did one map, which we'll show you for the first one, and then he became the editor at large who brought us a lot of our best contributors and played a big role in the second one. And then he's from the Northeast. He knows uh, a lot of the amazing people in New York who contributed. He knows his way around. He knows his music history and how many Caribbean people are secretly hiding out making New York just the northernmost Caribbean archipelago, as you'll <laughs> see. You know, so he became my co-director uh, to my great good fortune for the third one. and. Uh, did all the most of the heavy lifting on in a lot of ways. So we're going to show you a bunch of maps, but I wanted to just read a little bit from the introduction for the first one to just give you a sense of what I thought we were doing. In one of Jorge Luis Borges' most famous parables, cartographers make more and more exact maps until, quote, the craft of cartography attains such perfection that the map of a single province covered the space of entire, an entire city and the map of the empire itself, an entire province. In the course of time, these extensive maps were found somehow wanting. And so the College of Cartographers evolved a map of the empire that was of the same scale as the empire, and that coincided with it point for point. I, anybody who had to who had follow in postmodernism in the 80s spent a lot of time with that map, as did I. <laughs> but 
The man in this one paragraph essay on the exactitude of science is meant to be a fool's triumph, a confusion of the thing with its representation, an extension of logic to preposterous lengths. Even so, the tale has been read as a serious allegory about representation overtaking its subject. But a map is, in its essence, an intent, an arbitrary selection of information. Something I think we forget a lot is we get used to the same arbitrary selection. Here's where you drive, here's where you park, here's where you shop, here's where you eat. And uh, which is why when you make an arbitrary selection of like, here's where the monarch, monarchs are, and here's where the tiger swallowtails are, and here's where all the lesbian bars were in the 1950s, we start to understand the arbitrariness of maps. What the College of Cartographers could have done in pursuit of thoroughness and even vastness, and what many map makers and teams like it have done over the past half millennium, is produce an atlas. An atlas may represent many places in the same way, or the same place in many ways. And it, and it is in the myriad descriptions that the maps begin to approximate the rich complexity of the place, of a place, of any place. Scale matters. San Francisco map collector and scholar David Rumsey owns the first great atlas of France in two huge volumes, produced over 80 years and three generations by the Cassini family of surveyors, cartographers, and engravers. The magnificent prints, page after page, show the country in such detail that this particular spring and its surrounding grove are visible, that hamlet, the back road between a mill and a minor church. It's not Borges's, Borges' map on a one-to-one -one scale, but it approaches it. Scale matters, but maps select. The big maps in those old books show terrain exquisitely, but they don't show ownership in much detail or history, or economics, or air currents. They lack geology, biography, botany, and much else, despite the marvelous detail of their, their topography. It's not even really cartography a lot of it. It's the kind of drawings mixed with cartography in that old way that's kind of wonderful. Another Borges essay, and I should say David Rumsey, all of whose maps are online and downloadable for those of you who haven't gone to uh, his amazing collection. Um, you know, has been one of the great patrons and supporters and uses of this atlas. And uh, one of the beginnings of the project was spending time in his map collection um, for the whole kind of ad hoc team of contributors, and artists and writers, cartographers, and uh, people at University of California Press. So, and Leah Chandra, our designer. Another Borges essay, Avatars of the Tortoise, is an ela elaboration of a paradox by Zeno. And it's a better allegory for mapping. Achilles runs 10 times faster than the tortoise and gives the animal a head start of 10 meters. But the hero will never overtake the lumbering beast, according to Zeno's logic. <coughs> Quote, movement is impossible, argues Zeno, for the moving object must cover half the distance in order to reach its destination. And before reaching the half, half of the half, and before half of the half, half of the half of the half, and before that, Call the place to be mapped the distance, call mapping a race, and see that the cartographer in describing the territory must make another map and another and another, and that the description will never close the distance entirely between itself and its subject. Another writer, Italo, Italo Calvino, created another sense of vastness in his invisible cities from which this first atlas draws its title. His book contains descriptions of many magical and strange cities, often assumed to be the same beloved city, Venice, described many ways with implication that it could be described in many more. Venice, like San Francisco, is small. They are vast not in territory, but in imaginative <coughs> possibility. Every place is, if not infinite, then practically in inexhaustible. And no quantity of maps will allow the distance to be completely tra traversed. Any single map can depict only an arbitrary selection of the facts on its two-dimensional surface. For Infinite City, the selection has been a pleasure, an invitation to map death and beauty, butterflies and queer <coughs> histories, with the intention not of comprehensively describing the city, but rather of suggesting through these pairings the countless further ways it could be described. I also chose pairs in order to use the space more effectively, to play up this arbitrariness, and because this city is, as all good cities are, a compilation of coexisting differences of the Baptist church next to the dim sum dispensary, the homeless outside the opera house. The Borges map may have been coextensive with its territory, but it could not have been an adequate description of that territory, could not even approach, approach charting its flora, its fauna, its topography, and its history. 
A static map cannot describe change, and every place is in constant change. I map your garden. A swarm of bee arrives, or a wind blows the petals off the flowers. You plant an apricot sapling, or fell a shattered spruce. The season, or even just the light changes. Now it is a different garden, and the map is out of date. Another map is required, and another, yet another, to show where the marriage proposal, the later marital battle, the formative skinning of a knee or sting of a bee or first memory, and the hours of time lost to sheer reverie and pleasure took place. San Francisco has 800,000 inhabitants, more or less, and each of them possesses his or her own map of the place, a world of amities, amours, transit routes, resources, and perils radiating out from home. But even to say this is to vastly underestimate. San Francisco contains many more than 800,000 living maps because each of these citizens contains multiple maps, areas of knowledge, rumors, fears, friendships, remembered histories and facts, alternate versions, desires, the map of everyday activity versus the map of occasional discovery, the past versus the present, the map of this place or relationship to others that could be confined to a few neighborhoods, or could include multiple continents of ancestral origin, immigration routes and lost homelands, social ties or cultural work. Be wildly reductive. Say that every San Francisco <coughs> possesses only 10 maps, and that this has been true for all those who preceded us, and we're already imagining tens of millions of maps. This leaves aside other maps that might be <coughs> comprehensiveness, maps of the daily. You know the hourly weather of the plantings, of the rise of buildings and the falls of some of them, the journeys of Oscar Wilde through San Francisco on a day in 1882, or John Lee Booker in 1989, or Ohlone in 1688, a path that cannot be mapped, though perhaps the wanderings of Wilde and Hooker could be, of every inhabitant's most adventurous day in the city, of butterfly migrations and extinctions, and the return of raptors and coyotes to the city in the past decade or so. So that was, um, oh yeah, the chord. <laughs> it means that. I got one too, Josh. And Bruce doesn't work. Power. Yeah. At, uh, yeah. So, what else should I be saying? But, uh, yeah, Monarchs and Queens was almost the first one we finished and really became the template for all these forces, how all these forces could work together, how natural and human history could be combined. And, um, and on to death and beauty. Yes, I can, I can hop in here. Um, well, as, as Rebecca said, uh, we met, I guess for the first time when I interviewed you for some campus publication. But, but I, was, uh, I was a graduate student across the bay in Berkeley um, in the geography department there. And Rebecca sort of put out a, put out a call to sort of friends and like-minded folks looking for kind of contributors and ideas for this atlas. Um, for this first atlas of San Francisco, which it's worth saying was commissioned, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art commissioned Rebecca uh, to work on this, part of their 75th anniversary. Um, and we always wanted to do an atlas. And they sort of said, fabulous, let's do it. Um, and so I, as Rebecca said, I'd sort of contributed a bit to the first one, but one of the things that was really exciting to me right away, um, as I say, I was in a department of geography at Berkeley, but I was very much sort of on the humanities wing of that department, I suppose. Um, which is to say that a lot of my work focuses on literature, focuses on music, focuses on culture. Thinking about the ways in which places, all places are also ideas. And that the ways in which we conceive a place, the stories we tell about place, are immensely important both to our experience of that, but also shaping, shaping those places. Um, and one of the things I was really excited about by Rebecca's project and his analysis from the start is thinking about cartography not just as sort of visual representation, um, but thinking about maps as stories. Um, thinking about the ways in which all maps imply stories, just as all stories sort of contain or imply a map. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things that was really sort of interesting to think through and has been all the way through. Uh, this map, right, I think more so even than a, a narrative really gets to the kind of poetics of cartography. Um, I think that Rebecca could speak to sort of how the choices were made, but right, the question of, okay, how do you map emotion? How do you map the sort of ephemeral? How do you map the metaphysical? Um, and this, this map, Death and Beauty, 
thinking about things that exist in the city in these profound ways, um, but don't necessarily imply any one way of mapping. Right? There's a lot of ways you can map beauty, there's a lot of ways you can map death, um, but some decisions were made about how to do that. You know, this one really began, the San Francisco Chronicle used to publish a murder map every January that showed where the previous year's murders took place. And this is, you know, the power of maps has been one of the things, I always love maps, and like, I'm in a room full of geographers, anyone who doesn't love maps is, already, is not in this room. But I was really, well maybe somebody does, but they can step out now. <laughs> But, you know, was putting out maps was interesting, because I'm weird. I love a lot of things not everybody loves. And, uh, but people really respond powerfully to maps. And they have a kind of power of delight that's not like any other medium I know. People light up around them often. But they also have another, I think, a kind of indexical power. You look at the map, and you, it's a, you could go there. You could be there. You could imagine moving around. Even if it's a map of the moon, even if it's a map of Shanghai in 1799. There's some kind of invitation to explore, and you know, spatially and imaginatively. And if I just said to you, 99 people were murdered in San Francisco, and I think 2008 um, on this map, that's like a really humdrum fact. But if I show you that where each one took place, there's a kind of specificity, and particularly if you live here. But even if you don't, it's like, oh my, I could have walked by that that corner. You see that death has a pattern, that it's mostly on the east side of town, which is the poorer side. And, um, and it really has a different kind of emotional power. And like, what do you pair with, you know, could have been a love and death map. So I decided to take those geographical points and have the cartographer plot them on our template. And then what do you pair with it? I thought death and beauty, I wanted some sort of solace. And then what's beauty? I asked people what beauty is for San Francisco. And it became, it could have been the world's worst map where it's like, oh, poor people have murder and rich people have really nice scenery. <laughs> and uh, cypress trees are traditionally associated with death in European culture. And there's other kind of, the kind of Italian cypresses. But Monterey cypresses are this unique endemic species to the central California coast, probably evolved on uh, islands off the Carmel coast at a certain point in the geological evolution of the place. And so, but are now planted all over the temperate world. And they have this really just like, you know that when you see them, you see them in pictures of Point Lobos and Land's End and things like that in California. They're very much a signature tree. It's not really talked about. But they're all over San Francisco. And they're in the housing projects in the southeast where O.J. Simpson grew up. They're in the little parks and the big ones and along the um, sort of parkways uh, on the coast and et cetera. And I decided to make the, and they also felt like most of the death, most of the murders are of young men, and it felt like they also felt like a very masculine kind of beauty. It took away kind of a, you know, silly gender binary. So like, you know, that was a kind of arbitrary interpretive decision that goes into these maps. And, uh, so and I also want to say what I've been spent. I thought I was going to spend two weeks on it at the beginning of the month. What I've spent the month of. Uh, March on is writing about the death of my neighbor, Alejandro Nieto, murdered by the police on Bernal Hill. And you know, this is my kind of welcome to San Francisco. We're really fucked here uh, intro. As you probably know, San Francisco, like London and New York, is faced by sort of uh, gentrification on steroids uh, here because Silicon Valley is metastasizing and has produced an enormous amount of displacement. And some of, you know, gentr and there's a slogan used here a lot, gentrification equals death, about people dis, you know, literally we have a lot of elderly and frail people being evicted who die of the stress of the process or soon after. And when you evict somebody in their late 90s, they don't really, it's not really where you started, when you start a new life. And, uh, and there's just so many kinds of incredible brutality. And uh, you can read my piece in The Guardian if you want, but Alejandro Nieto in many ways, he was shot down by the police after white people phoned him in for looking suspicious after other white people harassed him. And it, um, you know, and he was a really beloved local guy, a Buddhist, uh, son of immigrants, uh, sort of pillar of the family. Uh, people had a lot of hope in. And so this is a Day of the Dead march in the Mission District, um, where one of the many places where the people devoted to his memory kind of insert his image and memory, and that's also the kind of thing you can map in a city, like 
where is memory? What happens to, you know, one of the things happening to San Francisco is memory and continuity are part of what gets evicted by gentrification, which brings us, and that this of course is not a new process. You could write the entire history of the city of like they evicted the Loney, uh, you know, and then the gold rush happened and the U.S. Uh, took away North, Mexico's northern half and started um, pushing out the Latinos and then, uh, you know, there's, at a certain point, we decided real estate was too valuable in San Francisco to have dead people, so we moved all the bodies down the peninsula to Coleman, the city of the dead. And uh, urban renewal, which you all know was nicknamed Negro removal, happened in some fairly brutal way. Well, it happened all across the country. It happened particularly in black neighborhoods in San Francisco, and then later they started pushing very near here, just other side of Market Street, this old working class retired a uh, waterfront worker neighborhood known as South in the slot, of the Slot by Jack London, who was born there, and by other people now known as Soma, so we could be born like Soho in New York. And uh, they destroyed this neighborhood that was kind of full of these retired guys to build this shiny no man's land of hotels and the Moscone Convention Center and stuff down there. But these guys were the guy. they were wobblies, they fought the great waterfront strike and unionization battles all up and down the west coast in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And they knew how to fight. They fought the toughest redevelopment battle in uh, US history. And they won some concessions, but of everything on this map of the neighborhood as, it, as we reconstructed it as it existed in 1960, only two things, only two things remained. Almost all the buildings are gone, all but one business is gone. And so, you know, and it's this landscape of amnesia. And then photographs by my uh, friend Ira Nowinski, who was a grad student who just went to see what's going on and stayed seven years to document and fight with them. Is again, it's like the, you know, it's that the pictures give some emotional resonance to the data that the map gives you. And, uh one of the things, again, as, as Rebecca said, I think one of the kind of key ideas of these atlases that's carried through all three, we're excited to show you, we'll show you five or six maps from the New York atlas, which comes out in October um, in a few minutes. But this is a, this is a map, um, I was going to say, is that juxtaposing two or more things and thinking about the ways in which cities are places that contain multiple histories, overlapping histories, overlapping stories, and one of the things we've been interested to do is think about, okay, when you put these two things uh, in relation to one another and chart them spatially, what are the stories that emerge? And this is a map that sort of thinks about uh, two things in conjunction. One is the sort of great migration of African Americans from the South to the Bay Area during World War II, uh, to work in the shipyards specifically, um, which is an immense number of people, essentially the Bay Area from having a negligible uh, by a population having quite a sizable one based on this particular uh, sort of political economic story. But then what does that look like? These people have jobs for two or three years, those jobs disappear, but here we are 67 years <coughs> later, those folks are still here. Um, and what's interesting there is that what this does, what we thought about is okay, what are the sort of cultural after effects of the epiphenomena of that sort of political economic story and that geographic story. And what we looked at here is the sort of story of black music in the Bay Area. Um, and broader black culture, too. And broader black culture, yes. Uh, yeah. um, focusing on sounds, but thinking about, OK, shipyards and sounds. West Oakland, Pointer Sisters are, are there. You know, Tupac Shakur and Marin City, which is where Marin's ship was, um, which is sort of this strange and interesting story about, OK, Marin County, generally a very white place, but Marin's ship was there. There's still those housing projects there. Um, so the idea here, right, is to think about, okay, put these histories in conversation with each other, show the ways in which they relate, um, and sort of tell a story that way. And it's funny, because it's really, you know, each of these maps is really arbitrary, and some of the African-American uh, newcomers moved into places opened up by incarcerating Japanese-Americans in the World War II camps. Most of them are now being gentrified and becoming paler in some ways. There's like so many, you know, mapping is, uh, you know, there are no one-to-one -one scale maps that show everything. It's always arbitrary, uh, or not arbitrary, but it's always sort of curated, sifted, selected. 
This wisdom app that was inspired in part by uh, Dick Walker's uh, uh, UC Berkeley longtime geographer, did a fantastic history of the Bay Area uh, and its environmental history. And he pointed out what I'd always kind of knew, known informally that the reason, if you look at all the green spaces on the map, this is all protected land that will never be developed. It's a huge amount of land. It's bigger than Yosemite National Park. And it's very easy for people to say, well, it's natural for nature to be nature. But of course, almost every one of these places represents some massive battle against the forces of development and uh, uh, market forces. And most of those, a lot of those key battles were led and fought uh, by women whose names are, you know, they're not the Muir on Muir Woods, they're not the uh, Sir Francis Drake on Drake Boulevard, they're not, you know, there's, there's, it's something I pick up again in the New York Atlas, very few things are named after women. So this is a map, in a way you can think of it as being like a Victoria map with the ornamental sort of cameos. Um, of some, which actually have the names, if you can't see them, of these women there, and then Dick Watt wrote us a great essay from reading it. But it's actually, you know, and you can call the stuff ornamentation, but it's really telling, like the photographs, a part of the story, like this is, these people are why these places exist as they do. And that, that kind of conjunction has really been something we've been able to do by returning to a kind of nice, unclean 17th, 18th, 19th century mapping that where it's cartography, but it's also art making and image making and as much writing as we want, where you know, it's a kind of multidisciplinary art of sorts. Yeah, and it's, it's important to say, right, I think that when, these, when this project started, when the first atlas uh, sort of got underway here in San Francisco, the sort of actual geography and context of San Francisco I think mattered in a major way, of course, being the center of a certain kind of tech, um, being the center of, okay, now we all walk around looking at our phones. The, the maps on our phones, like all maps, bespeak a kind of authority. Uh, maps are really powerful uh, documents, really powerful tools. And of course, one of the things that we think about whenever we sort of conceive of a map, okay, let's, is this a good idea, is does it press back or does it sort of offer a different kind of authority um, or undercut? the authority either of the sort of maps that are produced by states or by governments or by Google. Yeah, this map, the names before the names, came about, I was actually talking to a, a Native American, was he a geographer? I'm trying to remember what his field was. An environmental historian at the Estuary Institute, one of our fantastic kind of research uh, and environmental organizations. And I wanted to map the shell mounds that ring the bay and he said, like, we, we'd rather that you not tell people about exactly where they are and stuff. And, he's, and I was thought, like, okay, I'm just getting rebuffed. And then he was like, but look at this amazing work that's just being done. Our atlases are really pretty, but that doesn't mean they're not smart. And um, this is the first published uh, map to, with all this really new research that was being done by uh, Randy Milliken, an ethnogeographer. And, um, with the work of a bunch of tribal peoples to restore the original place names to the Bay Area, both uh, the Ohlone people on whose land you are now, the Miwok people to the north. And so, and it was kind of a, one of those things for me that was really shocking to see. I've been here since I was five, which is getting very close to half a century. And there's a few names like Petaluma, Tamales, uh, Pinole that are indigenous, I think Pinole, that are indigenous place names. But most of them were, and to see the most familiar place in the world with completely unfamiliar names was kind of shocking in a really good way. And I wanted to deliver that and to acknowledge that before this place was Silicon Valley or, or psychedelic music or any of the things people think it is, it was somebody else's homeland. And so this is the first map in the first book. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of it. And now, welcome to a whole other kind of trouble. <laughs> Yes, New Orleans. We'll show you a few New Orleans maps before we go to uh, go to New York. Um, this is a map from the New Orleans Atlas, unfathomable city that I I love particularly. Um, and one of the ideas behind it, Rebecca can speak to this, but it's basically what are the ideas here that we're kind of trying to trouble in terms of conventional mapping or the maps of the Louisiana coast in particular that we're used to seeing. Um, and one of the things that we often see, right, is that the coast is sort of presented as this discrete boundary, that land and water are separate. Whereas in a place like Louisiana, 
um, that boundary is often really fuzzy. Um, Louisiana loses something like a, a football field uh, of land an hour, which is a metaphor for Mecca. It's because you don't get football. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the easy one. But, uh, but in any case, this is, a, this is a sort of map that, on the one hand, tries to sort of make that point. It also presents the water, though, as this sort of super industrialized landscape that the Gulf of Mexico off of Louisiana is crisscrossed with these oil pipelines, um, which of course became uh, very much a topic of discussion with the BP spell, which is represented in, um, in sort of uh, narrative. Yeah, that, and that was the amazing thing while I'm working out of New Orleans is that the distinction between land and water is like the clearest, simplest distinction of maps, except that it's not down here both because the coastline's changing, because you have all this marshy, swampy bayou stuff that's both or neither. And then it was, it was really amazing to realize that every map, you'll, like 99.999% of the maps you'll see will make water look like this. There's this joke in one of Lewis Carroll's books about the map of the center of the ocean, and it's a perfect blank. And uh, except that this is a map of the, per the center of the Gulf, and it's not a perfect blank. It's a horrific industrial wasteland contributing to coastal erosion, climate change, and um, little things like the BP blowout in 2010. So an artist who did the artwork was wonderful. She took a sheet of tracing paper and drew birds so that they didn't blot out any of the details. And it was as a way to sort of suggest that this is also supposed to be wildlife habitat. You know, this kind of a cursed, scorched earth underwater. And this is the only place on Earth where I know where, like, the ocean caught fire large scale. And that's that when they decided to just burn the oil off the ocean after the spill. It's a really ghastly, strange place. And it questions how we see what we see and how we represent it in some very intense ways. Now, New Orleans, this is, well, I'll say a few things about this map. But um, New Orleans, of course, is a, is a Place. I do work on the Caribbean, I do work on music, so well, New Orleans is kind of my happy place, I suppose. <laughs> I, I love New Orleans. Um, and Rebecca and I sort of shared that affinity and had lots of people there. Um, so it was a great sort of uh, moment in time to sort of delve more deeply into New Orleans. It was also, of course, a very specific moment in New Orleans history. It was after Hurricane Katrina, um, some years after, but of course, a, the catastrophe that New Orleans is still doing. Um, and this was a map that came about, uh, I think, through a conversation I had with, a, with our editor at large now in the New York office, Garnet Cadigan, who's uh, from, from Jamaica but lived in New Orleans for 10 years. And he made this wonderful remark. He was talking about bounce music, which is the sort of local variant of hip hop in, in New Orleans. And he said, you know, it, it sort of charts a geography that's no longer there. That there's a sort of geography of sound. It's no longer present. He was talking, of course, about sort of before and after Katrina. What he was talking about is that this is a very, this is a sort of hyper local music. Lots of the weird shout out housing projects or blocks or corners. It's very geographic in that way. Um, and so we thought that it was a really interesting and good endeavor to sort of chart the development of dance music, the ways in which it's sort of called out in songs, um, and the ways in which that relates to loans now, and to interesting things like the high school marching bands where a lot of these people sort of trained. Um, a lot of interesting things kind of came out in the course of doing this work. And one more thing, the fantastic art by Brandon, what's Brandon's name? Brandon Odoms. He's that does a lot of all, sort of uh, music work for the musicians and things like that. He's very much part of the bounce music scene. And I sent him a lot of like 18th century line engraving cartouches, and I said, okay, these are kind of, most of these are kind of racist, racist and imperial, and, but they're great design work, and like we want a cartouche. And he basically gave us like the most anti-imperial, anti-colonial, radical <laughs> cartouche um, I, I will probably ever see, and I love it to death. And that spiraling cassette. Yes. Um, this is a, a map. Uh, of New Orleans, but a map of New Orleans that sort of shows and thinks about where New Orleans ends, or where it doesn't end. Um, I think the sort of basic idea here, Rebecca sort of even spoke to this in that, that snippet of the introduction she read to the first volume, that places, of course, contain, cities contain many places. Um, cities are sort of typified by uh, carrying sort of the resonance and presence of many, many places. 
Um, New Orleans, and in New Orleans in particular, uh, which has been sort of called historically the gateway to the tropics, or the sort of northernmost point of the country. There's all these ways of thinking about New Orleans as this sort of point where North America meets the Southern Americas um, in all these sort of profound and interesting ways, culturally, politically, all the rest. And so this was a map that was trying to get at that. But the way that we kind of endeavored to do it was to think about what's the particular kind of economic and geographic history that link New Orleans to the islands and to, the, and to Central America. And of course, the banana trade was one way that that happened. For decades, New Orleans was the center of the banana trade. A lot of the bananas, which were the first you know, tropical fruit that became a sort of daily part of North American's diet, came through New Orleans. Um, so what this map maps are the actual shipping lines of the United Fruit Company and the Standard Fruit Company and the ways in which these ships, you know, which steamed back and forth between Honduras, New Orleans, Cuba, Haiti, all these places, um, carrying people, carrying fruit, uh, carrying music, carrying all sorts of things, really shaped New Orleans and shaped these places, not least in Central America, uh, where these countries became, in the early part of the last century, banana republics, which were run uh, essentially out of New Orleans. But, Moving forward to today, you have uh, well, Harry Belafonte is doing a day of banana blood song, which Lil Wayne sampled when we got out of jail a few years ago. So we still hear about bananas. This map is called Land and Lies, and it takes like a the kind of mapping that great mapping, useful mapping, pragmatic mapping. Um, that really matters for healthcare battles and sort of human rights battles, etc. This is a map of the density of concentrations of lead in New Orleans that somebody there did, and something we've been talking about a lot lately in Flint um, as a factor in Freddie Gray's state of mind in Baltimore because he was a kid who experienced intense lead poisoning, etc. It was really a map, of, it's a map of New Orleans as a poisonous place, and again, it was part, we don't do that many pairings, somehow we ended up showing you a lot of, um, the, in the second and third atlases, but we do some, and somehow we're showing you a lot of them, but it's really led, reading the history of New Orleans for that, atlas, I noticed just how much kind of lies and deceits and euphemisms and evasions were part of the history, it's partly the history of racism, and Confederate denialism, the Civil War wasn't, you know, lies like the Civil War wasn't about slavery is on there, the KKK is not a racist organization, stuff like that. But from its founding to the present, when its mayor and its congressman and until not long ago, I think its governor were all in jail, um, you know, it's a really corrupt place. And uh, so the lie, and the lie, the lies and the lead made sense together as these poisons that come into the mouth, come out of the mouth, and kind of corrupt and corrode, both of which are imperceptible. You know, it's because you don't know when somebody's lying to you. You don't want know when somebody in power is lying to you necessarily, taking bribes, et cetera, that, um, you know, that it poisons you. And? Now on to more cheerful subjects. <laughs> we are Where are we, Josh? We are. Wait, wait, where's Shaolin? Where the hell is that? Um, so we should we should say New York with that shtick. We should say by the way, uh, don't take photos. Right? Yeah, no, no. Nobody seems to be taking photos. Keep not taking photos. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, at, the, at the behest of our publisher, we've been working all week to kind of put this put this out it's together. It comes out in October, but um, we're going to give you a sort of sneak peek of a bunch of maps. You're the first to be seeing a bunch of. These. Um, this map, this is a map of uh, Staten Island, otherwise known as Shaolin, to particularly to the sort of seminal hip hop group, the Wu Tang Clan, who are from Staten Island and who uh, became huge fans of kung fu movies that showed on 42nd Street in the 1970s and thereby developed this whole mythic geography of Staten Island based on these kung fu movies. Um, the text for this map is an interview I did with the RZA sort of talked about that kind of mythic theory. Um, but also, uh, Wu-Tang Clan being this kind of extraordinary, I think, really kind of conceptual art project, apart from being a great hip-hop group. Um, but this is a map of Shaolin, of the Wu-Tang Clan Shaolin, but in conversation, right, with actual Chinese Shaolin, uh, Chinese Staten Island, which is to say there is actually a Shaolin 
temple on Staten Island. Right? There's actually these sort of institutions of Chinese learning there. And the ways of putting these sort of stories in conversation we have all kinds of really interesting uh, stuff. And we have art from the wonderfully named artist Peach Dao um, doing kind of Chinese uh, style engravings of all the members of the Wu Tang Clan. So in this map opens Atlas, it's called City of Song. We kept talking about how one of the things that really distinguishes cultural capitals, London, Paris, New York, maybe Beijing, I'm sure you can think of a lot of other ones, is that you know, you know them even if you've never been there in some ways. You know, it was funny for me as a kid when I first went to these places because whether it was Clash songs or Ramon songs or Dickens novels or things like that, that like they come to you through culture and you're sort of like a, an honorary citizen in a way in you, who op occupies often a very sort of geographically skewed and dreamy place. And, um, you know, so we thought about mapping movies, books, um, et cetera, and we decided to just map songs. And this is just like a, you know, a selection of songs on the places they're about to really just give that sense of how people from afar are coming to know the place. And it's really felt like this is a port of entry, not the literal point of entry like Ellis Island used to be and, you know, LaGuardia and JFK airports are now, but the magnitude that the songs themselves are a kind of port of entry that, you know, we all emigrate to New York through, through music in some ways if we're not from there. Right. We're very interested, I think, too, in just thinking about, okay, there's this sort of city of dreams that we all come to a place like Manhattan with, uh, but how does the city as it is rub up against that city of dreams? And so that a lot of the text that goes with this map, we have various people talk about the songs that evoke New York for them, sort of that, that comes up. <laughs> We get one question. <laughs> I won't read any of these, but the California Dreamin', you might have noticed, uh, out there in Queens, the mamas and the papas. We thought that was the one that was the one that doesn't actually mention the location. We thought geography of Queens is part of that dream of California. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are in California. So. Um, this is a map. This is the second uh, map in the book. Um, and the idea, right, is to think about, okay, the sort of mythic city, the city of dreams, what is it that we sort of project onto it? And then this really kind of gets down to the nitty gritty in a way, which is to say, it's called Capital of Capital, subtitle, How New York Happened. And it's basically a map about how and why New York became the huge city that it is, how it became around 1900, the biggest, uh, most populous city in the world, 300 years after its founding, no longer, of course, but it was at that time. Um, and what is, what is it? What is that extraordinary story? And how can we talk about it spatially? And of course that's a story about the sort of larger story of global capitalism in all kinds of ways, from the mercantile moment to an industrial one to now a, a sort of post-industrial one. Um, but the background layer of this map, and we have all kinds of sort of moments here from the Dutch, uh, from the Dutch trading fort to the sort of banks founded by Alexander Hamilton to now Citigroup contemporary capital. Um, so the background layer here, which we worked with uh, the geographer Richard Campanella on, is based in New Orleans, the wonderful work for us there. Um, he, did, he produced this map based on historical maps, essentially just showing the growing footprint of the city uh, since the early 1600s. Um, and I'm going to read just a little bit of, uh, of the piece I did to go along with this, uh, with this map, and we'll show you just a few. This was a town founded by liberal traders, not religious zealots. The 17th century Dutch were much less given than any of their contemporaries to discriminating against anyone with coins to pay. And that ethos remained key to a town whose first permanent foreign trader was a Hispaniola born mulatto called Rodriguez, whom the Dutch left to set up shop by the battery in 1614. And where in 1654, 23 Sephardic bankers fleeing Catholic Brazil came here to forge North America's first Jewish community. The English, who took over the colony and renamed it New York in 1666, were less tolerant. But with plenty of Dutch and other traders remaining here, so did something of their willingness to hear a remonstrance from local Quakers in 1657, insisted not merely that they should be allowed to worship as they pleased, but asserted that all followers of all faiths on American soil be allowed the same freedom. New York remained a market town uniquely open to people of all lands for commerce. 
unless, of course, they were commerce. For enslaved Africans were present here from the start. When Peter Stuyvesant decreed that a high spiked fence should be built along New Amsterdam's northern edge in 1653, it was the, quote, company's Negroes who built the rampart that gives Wall Street its name. Where Wall Street abuts the East River, the English built an auction block from which thousands of slaves were bought or loaded onto boats in the 1700s, bound for southern slave ports for the Caribbean. The wealth that accrued to Europe from the West Indies dwarfed what came to England from many of its North American colonies. The most important and lucrative bits of New World real estate in the 18th century ran the old French sugar juggernaut of Saint-Domingue, whose slaves were developed and renamed Haiti, and also in England's prized plantation islands like Barbados and Jamaica. Those little territories were far more important to the English crown than the northern colonies. This fact would be key to how the American Revolution unfolded. But it was also key to the larger role that New York played as a port closer to Britain than Kingston or St. Kitts were, but also far enough south that its harbor, unlike Halifax's or Boston's, didn't freeze over in the winter in building Britain's maritime network. New York didn't merely help bind the Antilles sugar trade to London. It was where sugar was traded for North American codfish and other goods, like tea and porcelain, to say nothing of opium, imported here from far off China. Fast forward. Years. Since those days, the size and cloud of the financial sector has only grown. With the city's new economy producing not mails or dresses, but fashion ads and information and bits of code, New York's wealth rests not on its stature as a great capitalist city, but on its role, ever tenuous, as the quote command and control center for global finance that David Rockefeller Jr. envisioned when he urged and oversaw the building of a new World Trade Center. The twin towers that his vision saw built, and which loomed over Manhattan's southern tip until their destruction, along with the lives of thousands working inside in September 2001, are gone. But Rockefeller's vision has won out. The new regime resembles what came before. The bosses of Wall Street, shoveling between New York's boardrooms and Washington's halls of power, are still calling the shots, and still shaping the built environment of the city, too. Not by growing its productive capacity or industrial base, but by helping to finance and build ever pricier condo towers, his duplex and triplex apartments are often bought up by Russian oligarchs or Saudi princes whose fortunes derive from the same sort of primary resource extraction, extraction that once enriched the Astors and Rockefellers and who now rub shoulders on their visits to town with shitty traders shuffling oil futures to hell the Cirque. Many of these hundred million dollar units serve more as parking places for speculative capital hidden behind shell companies and LLCs and as homes. But their net effect is still to drive up prices and make the city ever less livable for those here who live upon their income, or try to, in a city whose geography of finance, in its way, has been hollowed out too. Today, you can still walk from the old seat of the Dutch West India Company, marked with a plaque by the weekly battery, past the two great office holes in the ground where the World Trade Center once stood to reach the stock exchange whose imposing Greek revival facade still guards the Great Hall, once abuzz with shouting traders, there remains the hallowed heart of American capitalism. Even if all the NYSE's trades these days actually occur in an air-conditioned data center across the river in Malawi, New Jersey. The island on which the exchange sits, though, the heart of a metropolis where the world's people still come to find fortune, remains a place desired and desirable for offering up all the very best that money can buy in food and clothes and culture and art, which can still, at its best, peel back the city's layers to excavate its past and illuminate its present. One such fine work, a couple of years ago, found the artist Kara Walker erecting a giant, quote, subtlety, which was anything but, in the cloying sweet air of a rustic old fixture of the industrial waterfront, the old Domino Sugar Factory on Brooklyn's edge and right across from lower Manhattan which was built by the Habermeyer family in 1871 and was responsible once for refining fully half of America's sugar cane, unloaded here from the West Indies into the sweet white powder from which Walker crafted a great sugar sphinx, shaped like a lean and black woman and dedicated to the, quote, unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the New World. But what spoke as plainly to where the city's heading came in the form of an announcement from the developer who bought the Domino factory site and was all set as soon as the ark was gone to begin filling its ghostly halls with construction crews converting the state environment to industry and to exploitation into more condos for the wealthy. 
The developer is a condition of being allowed to build a pair of 55-story apartment towers in the site of the factory as well. Struck a deal with the city to provide several hundred affordable units for local residents. But the full plan for the site, say its initial estimates, will cost $1.5 billion to build. For the 80% of its 2,000 units that will be, quote, market rate, they'll be looking, one can be sure, to get at least a few million apiece. This is a map called Carboniferous that looks at New Yorkers' carbon footprints. There's a, a wonderful young scholar, Daniel Alcala. Aldenicon. Um, Aldenicon. I never had to say it out loud before. Just replied to emails and things. But uh, what uh, document to what people, you know, there's a tendency to think like, oh, you live in the city, you take subways, you have a very small carbon footprint. But he had came up with some more elaborate ways to map affluent lives that spill over into other places and consumptions and things like that. And really, uh, kind of his amazing conclusion, conclusion was that the most environmental people in New York City were the ones who live in NYCHA housing, New York City Housing Authority, um, you know, public housing. And so we combined that kind of mapping, that, you know, um, by that kind of layers of mapping with labels. Because when you think about New York and climate change, in the previous books, we looked at what climate change will do to these places, but here we looked at what, climate, what these places are doing to climate change. And David Koch and the Koch brothers are not very far from 350.org, and New York is, you know, that's kind of the essence of what all cities are when you look at them, these places of unresolved conflict that can continue for centuries between uh, capitalism and anti-capitalism, between the forces seeking to destroy the world climatologically, and to save it, you know, Josh Fox is in there, Wall Street is in there, uh, the Sierra Club is in there. And really, but really to try and understand this place as a place of production and consumption of fossil fuels, but also production and consumption, um, or production of ideas about fossil fuels, politics about fossil fuels, um, power, uh, popular power against, uh, and et cetera. So it's really, an attempt to elaborate, how does the geography of the city contain, generate, um, you know, rep repress, uh, celebrate these forces? Yeah, we have just a couple more for you. Um, this is the map of uh, Queens that sort of riffs on and engages with the fact that the borough of Queens is uh, the most linguistically diverse place on the planet, um, pretty unequivocally. There's uh, the sort of estimates vary, might be 800 languages, might be 1,500, hard to say. But uh, there's an extraordinary diversity of languages spoken in the borough of Queens. This is where sort of immigrant New York really lives now. Um, but beyond, of course, other parts of the city too, but this is really its, it's heart in a lot of ways. Um, but one of the things that's extraordinary about that story is that not only is it that okay, there are people from every continent, every country who are, who are in Queens speaking these languages. But you often have people who are the last speakers of certain languages. But there are dialects you know, from the Himalaya, indigenous languages from Central America, other, other tongues. Where, where are these people? And sometimes they're in Ridgewood, sometimes they're in Jamaica, uh, Jamaica Queens, that is. Um, and we worked on this map with a wonderful linguist called Daniel Kaufman, who runs an organization called the Endangered Language Alliance, who sort of runs a kind of network of, of these folks who, uh, who are engaged in sort of nurturing their mother tongues, I suppose, um, and has done amazing work in that, in that regard. It's worth saying about New York that one of the things we found that's different from New Orleans and San Francisco, which are both cities which, of course, have people who are super passionate about them. There's a lot of sort of expertise. There's a lot of uh, people who, as I say, are very passionate. But New York, it's a, the sort of scale, both of the city and of the sort of number of sort of obsessives about various aspects of it, right? So sort of if you want the person who's spent 20 years finding every place of worship in New York, it's like that guy's out there. It's called Tony Karen's on call. He'll tell you, <laughs> you know, where the Buddhist temple is hidden behind the Thai restaurant, and, you know, mass I mean, he, He's done that work, and Daniel Kaufman sort of one of these people. Um, and so it's been such a joy, it's such an amazing thing that I just moved to the city 
full time a couple of years ago. Um, so to be able to sort of explore with these people is such a such a pleasure. So the idea with a lot of these maps is just to kind of highlight their work. Um, and so this map is one of those, a map of the languages in Queens. We have all these sort of particular sites, right, where these extra rare languages are spoken in the region. We should say, for those of you who don't know the books, every atlas is, every map is paired with an essay, uh, Mother Tongues in Queens. It's an essay by uh, Suketu Meta, who you might know from Ma Maximum Bombay, his great sort of cultural geography of uh, the city of his, I think of his birth, and um, who grew up in Queens and is with feet in many languages. Onward to Archipelago. Anything, does anybody notice anything unusual about this map? <laughs> so this really came out of, a, uh, you know, two, two things we, that we really wanted to articulate. This map I really think of as the lie that tells the truth. One is that one out of eight people in New York City, I believe, is that higher? Is of Caribbean origin, many of them recent arrivals. So there's, you know, we think, we. We think of New York as black, of course a lot of the black people there are Caribbean, we think of it as Jewish, we think of it as a lot of things. We don't always remember that it is sort of the northern capital of the Caribbean ethnically, the way LA is the northern capital of Latin America, or what, that's how we used to describe it in the 80s. So another thing we don't think about that often is New York is an archipelago, There's that except for the Bronx, which is part of the continental uh, United States, everything, and the other four boroughs are islands, and they're surrounded by all these little islands. And so this map began with me sort of inarticulate describing what I thought and then having to just like make bad uh, printouts and cut things up and scan them and send them to the cartographer, uh, our wonderful cartographer, also Berkeley. There's a lot of you see Berkeley uh, at this atlas. Uh, Molly Roy also grad. Is she a graduate of a geography program? Undergrad. Undergrad, yeah. undergrad graduate, yeah wonderful independent cartographer, did almost all the cartography on this atlas, um, made this fantastic version where the Car where New York really is part of the Northern Caribbean. So, and you know, let me hand it back to the Caribbeanist at the table. We'll, we'll, we'll race ahead, but just one, one other sort of thing to say here is that one thing about sort of Caribbean New York, I, I think this is true for a lot of regions and parts of the world, people who come to a city like New York and sort of come into contact in ways that don't necessarily happen where they're from. And that's extra true, I think, in the Caribbean, where people from islands which are literally separated by the sea in New York have sort of had to and have connected in ways that are important politically, culturally, um, in all kinds of ways. So this is a this is sort of map that, that gets at that. And of course, I think we'll, we'll make it glow a little more with the West Indian Labor Day Carnival in Brooklyn is the largest public yearly event in New York every year something like a million and a half people, which on its own is sort of an extraordinary fact. It's like, okay, when do a million people come out? It's for the Caribbean day. This is a map called Wildlife, inspired by the artwork of a Mexican refugee, uh, San Francisco artist named Tino Rodriguez. And it really is looking, I would have the map about capital, the kind of, um, the will, the sort of diurnal will to profit, to control, to market, to put a price on everything, to buy and sell. And this is about the wild sort of life of erotic and spiritual uh, New York. And also New York in relationship to animals. And I think of wildlife in the city, which in New York, like many other cities, has greatly multiplied in recent decades. I think of wildlife as um, the, t the, the residents who don't pay rent among other things. It's one of the, I think it's one of the things that's liberating about seeing a red-tailed hawk or a peregrine falcon or a coyote or a raccoon in the city. So it was really also, and I was looking at these kind of other presences of pleasure gardens and promenades, cruising boat, you know, different kinds of dancing and uh, sort of social and, and uh, erotic dancing, not, not ballet so much. But also New York has a number of saints and saintly figures and uh, just this all these sort of break breakouts into a kind of liberation of the body and soul from the strictures of, of you know getting and spending and laying waste your lives. Yeah, and I guess we'll, we'll close here at, at night. <laughs> um, this is a map. This is a map of Harlem uh, called Black Star Lines, which is really a kind of engagement with Harlem's history and resonance as 
as a kind of black mecca, and as promised land, as a kind of cultural capital. Um, but what this, what this does, we were trying to think of how can we do this in a fresh way, not just sort of marking where Duke Ellington and Marcus Garvey or, or James Brown performing at the Apollo. And what we, we thought to do as a way to sort of chart the built environment as well is to think about what's sort of sacred in Harlem, thinking about places that are sacred both in a secular sense, places where people become stars or are hallowed in the culture, but also sacred in a religious sense because of course Harlem is full of churches, mosques, uh, synagogues as well. Uh, and what we have here is we chart some of the sort of iconic sacred sites that are secular, some that are religious, and the many that have been both. This is a very interesting history of theaters that become churches, that become theaters again. Uh, and it's a sort of wonderful way to think about the sort of interplay of the sacred and secular in this sort of, uh, this sort of space that's been thought of as mecca. And the background here is a chart uh, of the night sky over Harlem in 1934 on the night that uh, the Apollo Theater opened. Um, so we should probably note that. Or we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> so, Thank you so much. That's our hour. Thank you. So